and welcome to the communism. My name is Ciprian Nekula and I'm a Roma activist. I'm teaching at the University of Political Science in the Master uh, on Romani Studies. And uh, I'm also the chair of the Roma Education Fund board and the founder of the RSL movement in Romania that wish and uh, fight to uh, raise Roma voices in order to uh, be listened and to impact on the policies that affect them. Today we are going to talk about communism. Sure, communism has many forms and ways of being interpreted, but if we refer to the Eastern European countries and to the Romanian communism where I had my experiences and my research, I would say that we have at least two parts to refer, the communism and the national communism. You will see what is the distinction between one and another and as well how this impacted on Roma. Well, Personally, I grew up in the communism only 10 years. So, I wouldn't say that I had the experience of the communism. I do remember only positive things about communism from my childhood and only one single frustration. You know what is that? Banana. And banana because in the communist times, banana was really hard to get. It was only during the, communist, uh, the Christmas time and uh, usually we were getting green bananas that were supposed to put it on the heater to wait for two weeks to, to get cooked and to be eaten. So, yeah, that was my frustration. But then after the communism, what I heard about this regime was only negative things. It was always about the oppression that the communists, you know, uh, put in order, the control of society, the freedom of speech. Everything that was uh, uh, constructed as the image of the communists was really negative. Later on, when I met Nikolai Gheorghe and I started working in Roma communities together with the sociologists that invented and recreated the Roma movement in Romania and contributed internationally to raise the Roma voices uh, at different levels, uh, I met a lot of Roma that were saying communism was the best regime to us. And you hear that once, twice, and then I wonder, you know, how is this possible? Well, I grew up with the idea that the communism was bad. So I asked some of them, you know, what means this to you? Why communism was so good to you? And they were saying that communism was the best regime because they were giving them social rights and social protection. Everybody has access to jobs and basic access to uh, services, healthcare, housing, uh, education, and others. So I say, okay, Probably this subject, it's a stereotype that, uh, uh, you know, I created because of the uh, media and the opinion leaders formers in Romania. So I needed to uh, study in deep. So I decided my PhD thesis uh, subject to be this one. How Roma managed to, uh, uh, to go through communism from ethnic and uh, uh, economic perspective. What was the struggle, if any? So, this discussion I will put it in three major parts. First of all, it's about official policies of the communist regime in Romania in relation to Roma. And we are going to talk about three main documents, one from 1949, when uh, it was a roadmap established on Roma, another one from 1977, uh, when it was a kind of study and policies towards Roma, and another one in 84 when actually they were reporting what they did with the plan from 77. Another uh, uh, cluster of this discussion is unofficial policies uh, uh, of the state towards Roma. And that's uh, my work uh, that I've been doing in the uh, archives of the uh, uh, ex-security, where I discover uh, plenty, thousands of documents uh, in relation to Roma. And uh, that reflects somehow the other side, the other side of the coin, when actually they were talking, you know, among themselves, what they really worried and what they want to do with Roma. And third, and probably the most important to me at least, it's Romani voices. I, I want to hear uh, Roma that were passing through this regime, uh, what is their perception, how they felt all these policies, and how they managed to uh, to keep being Roma in such an oppressive system. After the Second World War, where Roma had a very negative experience being deported to death in Transnistria from Romania, based on a census that was done especially for Roma, um, they entered a new era. And the new era was the communism. In 1946, there were elections. And 
the Communist Party that was part of a democratic bloc, they released a manifesto to target Roma. The manifesto sounded like this. Dear Roma sisters and brothers, please go out and vote for us. Let's stop the oppression of the bourgeoisie. Together we can do it. That was the message of the Communist Party in 46. Then it was a period that Roma could get finally a special status, official recognition of national minority. Viorel Kim, a Romanian historian, talks about this and he said that actually Roma was missing this uh, uh, opportunity due to various reasons. One of the main reasons could be the leadership of the Roma at that time, that were considered to be part of bourgeoisie and they played some political games together with the pro-Nazi uh, government that was previously uh, in power in Romania. So, they lost this opportunity. Other explanation is that actually the communists never uh, considered that as being possible. The direction on Roma was established in 49, when they established clearly that Roma is a social group and nothing else than that. Let me go through this documentary a bit to show you the five points, the roadmap that the communists in 49 established for Roma. First one. The problem of Tsigan, it's first of all a social problem. Just a note here, I will mention Tsigan and not Gypsy translated as it is translated into English. I will use the Romanian term Tsigan because they have other meanings and different etymology. Tsigan is an extremely pejorative term used for Roma. Gypsy is as well pejorative but uh, used in other conditions and with other et etymology. So I will use the original term. However, when I will refer to, uh, to Roma, I will always mention Roma. So, first uh, point in this document was the problem of Tsigan is first of all a social problem. Dot. The second point. Tsigani that are in the labor force and speaks the language of the population, the mainstream population, and send their kids to school and they are already in a process of assimilation, they don't constitute a preoccupation for us, except the fact that we want to raise the level of culture, which means, that's in the bracket, liter literation, education for hygiene and social assistance. And as well, we should fight against nationalism that bourgeoisie uh, used to keep the old prejudices that block the process of brotherhood between this population and the rest of nationalities living in Romania. Beautiful, isn't it? Third one has to be researched. The Tsigan that were um, uh, given land by the agrarian reform Almost 20,000 Tsigan were, give, were given land. And they were given land not because of being Roma, but because being soldiers in the Second World War fighting for Romania. Everybody else was getting it. Fourth, in the field, it must be researched the situation of Tsigan and must be realized a statistics of the Tsigan that are not included in the labor forces, especially the nomad one. Five. The main problem constitutes the problem of the nomad Tsigan, the one living in tents, semi-nomads, and their liberation under the influence of the Buli Basha, the leader of the community. And this will, uh, will, will, will be necessary to be applied according to the Soviet example. I finish quoting for the document of the Communist Party from 49. As you can see, there were distinguished two main categories. Nomads and sedentary. Why did they do that? Well, there are at least two reasons that uh, I uh, uh, can propose to you for reflection. First of all, it's the difference of culture and practices. Sedentary 
were closer to the Romanian population are is sedentary, and nomads were very different, you know, walking around, producing their goods, selling them. The one could be controlled by the state, the other couldn't. The one couldn't be controlled and included in school, labor, education, healthcare, the other one could not, and they were also accused of spreading disease. But this is not really the communist theory about distinguish between two Roma categories. They didn't invent these two categories. Others did it. Who do you think? Well, pro-Nazi. They were the ones distinguished first Roma between these two categories, nomads and sedentary. So uh, this is actually their reason uh, to exterminate the nomads because they were the problem. They were spreading disease, they were not controlled, they were all, all the attachments that are given to, uh, to these people. So, basically, communists imported the same vision about Roma from the pro-Nazi government that was previously in power in Romania. And this is it. They forget to, to apply any measure of this, and um, what they stick to was to stop nomadism, to make sure that Roma are getting sedentarized, and that they are confiscating their gold. Why that? Because nomads basically don't invest in you know, big things that you cannot carry with you. They don't have houses, they don't have uh, households to keep uh, and to invest there. They are investing in gold. Gold is small and valuable. So uh, that was one of the main targets of the communists while it was forbidden to hold gold except some small jewelries and uh, this is it. Otherwise everything was confiscated by the communist state. So Roma became a target to be confiscated this gold from them. That was the main preoccupation of the uh, uh, communist regime till 77 and even after. But in 77 uh, a study was released and an action plan which is here presented um, that was targeting Roma in a direct way. First of all, let's start with this. The number of Roma. In 77 was a census. And here's, here are the numbers. 229,986 persons were registered as Roma. But they were suspecting this is not the real number. And the real number, they claim that is 541,000 people. Out of which, 40, uh, 400 74,000 sedentary and 66,500 semi-nomads, 500 nomads. So basically they were talking about 500 plus 66,500, uh, 67,000 people that were in this situation of being nomad or semi-nomad. So these documents basically refer to them because to the uh, other Roma they don't refer too much. It's not uh, uh, a bigger issue, except the fact that they, they were supposed to invest more in education, probably in housing, healthcare, uh, more hygiene. And see, in case of nomads, they are calling them even in this document social parasites. So they're considering them as a danger, uh, a language close to uh, positioning them as lumpen proletariat. They never uh, use this term, but out of the attributes they were giving to these people, that's the ten, uh, uh, direction. However, this document evaluates, first of all, the situation of Roma in different fields of social life. You know, healthcare, housing, labor, education, public order, culture, and so on. Uh, and once they evaluate, they also propose measures. Measures basically are towards assimilation. Roma were supposed to become proletariat, or Romanians. Well, that's the dilemma, because in 1027 it was not the question of proletariat, it was the question of being the true Romanian, real Romanian. While uh, National Communism was in place mystifying history and building a new image of what Romanian means, it was also a direction that Roma were supposed to become the new Romanian. What follow is the implementation. Who else uh, 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 was interested about this except the uh, party? Well, no one, because this document is not like in our time that you consult with uh, uh, a large group of NGOs and activists and so on. No way. 
the part I did it and it was supposed to be implemented. Sure, we, we, we've been lucky because some Roma intellectuals like Nikolai Gheorghe that was working at the sociology department, the sociology institute, uh, he was able to influence a little bit the document so he could include also some positive measures for Roma, affirmative actions for Roma and not only uh, oppressive measures as it was done at the beginning. However, this document was supposed to be implemented in the next five years. The Communist uh, Party and the, uh, uh, the regime, the authority, had also these five years plans. So this one also entered in this logic. In five years they were supposed to have results. In '84, it was a report published about the action plan from 1977. Well, the conclusion is that uh, it happened some measures, there were some progress, but uh, in, in big lines it's a failure. And it's a failure because some institution did not uh, uh, proceed as it instructed and Roma could not be uh, fully included. Here it is. Here we end up with official policies on Roma. Nothing else was published by the um, uh, communist states in relation to Roma except these three documents. The 49, the roadmap, the 77, study and action plan, and 84, a report related to 77 action plan that claims that not much was done. Well, if official policies were not that many and did not, didn't give us the opportunity to, uh, to uh, find the way how uh, the communist agenda was on Roma, there are other documents that actually can give us more precise data. And uh, I was happy to discover in the archive of the ex-communist services, uh, intelligence services, uh, a lot of documents on Roma. Over a thousand uh, pages that are there, uh, with cluster in different files, counties, uh, subjects, and so on. So. It's a mine that has to be digged uh, um, uh, carefully and uh, to be uh, reflected in uh, next studies because I do think that there is too little information about Roma and Communism uh, published. So I'm inviting everybody that has this interest to, to go and study in the archives uh, this document as they are giving so many information and details that uh, really need to be reflected on. What I did uh, is to cluster them first of all and to take a look uh, to their political interest and their wishes, the genuine uh, wishes of the communists related to the Roma. So um, I clustered them as well in two main parts. Uh, first of all is the period 50 to 70 when the main, main obsession of the uh, communist agenda was, as I mentioned already, gold to be confiscated and uh, uh, centralization. Uh, in both cases uh, from the communities where I've been uh, doing my interviews and, and field work, uh, I have some stories. Uh, but let me tell you first uh, about the gold. So, gold was a good that Roma wants to keep. They don't want to give away what's their fortune. You know, inherited from their parents, grandparents and so on. So, that's not something to give easily. Then, I was talking with a police officer from uh, Roma origin, Mr. Bitsu, a colonel, uh, that he told me that all the police officers were uh, struggled to get uh, uh, into the role when the rights were in the Roma communities for the gold. Why that? Because most of them were, you know, getting Two coins of gold, one given to the state, one they will keep it from themselves. Well, at least that's the myth uh, about it. But uh, it was a privilege for a police officer to search in Roma community because they were getting something for themselves too. So, corruption, it's a long story in Romania, it's not new with us, stays here for a long, long, long time. Getting back to our subject, um, this period with uh, uh, with the gold and centralization that was reflected in the security files, the next one it's more about the political danger of the Roma. Actually, Roma being a social group was in question by the Romanian state and by the security. And that's because in 70, uh, as you know, 71, it was the uh, first Roma Congress in London and uh, these news came here too and there were Roma attending from uh, ex-Yugoslav country. So, um, 
from the neighborhoods. So it was a big worry uh, in the Romanian security that Roma might, Roma from Romania, might get in touch with these people and then might create a, a ethnic uh, a political platform and uh, protest and raising up and create end clubs and so on. So what I did for that is first of all making sure who are the enemies. They did a census for Roma intellectuals. Well, it's a funny uh, result because they've been asking in their, all the districts and counties and so on, uh, how many Roma intellectuals are in your area? And the answers are quite funny. Some none, some other 30, but 29 of them in the uh, 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 Philharmonic, in the orchestra, musicians. Um, and uh, why I say it's funny? Because uh, that's something quite specific for Romania. Once you are out of the stereotype, you know, being an intellectual, using proper Romanian language, uh, having a, a respectable job, and so on, you're not Tsigan anymore. Because the image of Tsigan is, that, is not that, uh, this one. You cannot be intellectual and Tsigan. And if you are, that's a strange situation. So, uh, whatever uh, Roma were in various positions, public positions, even police officers and so on, um, they are not considered to be Roma. That's why this study says that uh, very few. Uh, by the way, uh, the Communist Party, uh, once uh, they got in power, because Roma had healthy social origins, they were put it in you know, a leadership position, at the uh, village level, upper than that, in police, in uh, call halls, uh, or uh, other institutions. So, um, these people were not recorded as, uh, uh, as Roma, but as member of the Communist Party and support of them, so they had nothing to do with Roma. All right, um, and this danger also contributed some internal factors, not only external factors, uh, and the internal factor was mainly uh, the sociologist Nicolae Gheorghe. A Roma that uh, passed through uh, uh, education and he was the best uh, uh, student at his university, graduating first as grades. Uh, so he had a, a personal dilemma and a professional dilemma. The personal was why he is considered to be different and, you know, disrespectfully, you know, attach this image of being Tsigan. Because he was, you know, an intellectual, being first in university, and he understand why people are so mean when it comes to Roma. So he wanted to study the origin of Roma and to, to, to find out what it is that uh, different, first of all. And secondly, uh, from uh, uh, professional reasons, he was also uh, following uh, uh, famous anthropologists, Strauss and, 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 and others, um, to, uh, to investigate you know, the cultural differences and uh, actually what means cultural differences and uh, superior and inferior culture. It was his primitives in, uh, with uh, this coma uh, to, uh, to analyze. Anyway, so what happened? Uh, he went in a community, in not only one, but he stopped in one for longer time. And then he became the secretary of a traditional leader, Ion Chaba. And together, having a, you know, a, a political legitimacy of uh, Ion Chaba uh, as a political leader, and Nikolai Gheorghe as intellectual, able to write letters, to understand policies, to know how to address, uh, create a kind of force that uh, generated somehow uh, an impact at national level. First of all, uh, they were defending uh, Roma internally, saying that, well, sometimes racism is here, uh, police are doing some abuses, uh, you know, very, uh, how to say, diplomatic language. They never uh, uh, touch uh, subjects that they could compromise them. However, uh, Nicolae felt that this is not enough. So in 80, he sent uh, uh, to um, Liberation uh, uh, French Journal a letter talking about racism in Romania against Roma, police brutality, and the situation of Roma in Romania, exclusion, marginalization, and the situation how he saw at that time a sociologist, but also a Roma that discovered himself as Roma. Well, what happened, this letter was also taken by uh, Free Europe, was really there. So the message went back to Romania and other people start also write letters to um, um, uh, Free Europe um, 
sure, using a nickname, Nicolae Tzu, he used the nickname Alexandru Danciu, and then it was uh, uh, another uh, Roma sociologist, Vasile Burta, under the name Cosmina Cosmin, so a girl name, writing another letter to the Free Europe, claiming that actually it's true, Romania is full of racism when it comes to Roma. So, uh, in the security files, everything was changed as policy. They were looking for sources, they were looking for documents, they would start employing uh, people that would translate letters in Romani language, they would monitor people that interact with Nicolae Gheorghe and uh, others from this group of people. Mirescu Ioan from Timisoara was also a, a Roma leader that uh, got engaged in this. They were in connection with members of the other uh, 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 countries that uh, had Roma origins and um, um, they were Roma activists. It is a funny story about this. Chaba was closer uh, to the uh, political leader, closer to the uh, communist regime. He was, you know, in relationship with Ceausescu family, and uh, you know, he had the role of uh, uh, political leader of Roma at that time. So he was invited for the second uh, uh, international uh, uh, Romanian Union Congress uh, in Germany uh, to attend. So. In Romania at that time, to travel, you were supposed to go to the police and security to ask for the passport. You, you could not hold your passport at home. So he went there, he applied to get the passport in order to travel to this uh, congress. Smart officers, they did something. Say, look, they were waiting till the congress ended, and then they called Chaba to say, Mr. Chaba, you can come and pick up your passport, you can go to the conference. Useless, huh? Well, the reply of Chubb was excellent, brilliant. He said, I don't need it. I've been already and I got back. And I didn't know that. How this happened? Because Roma were using already networks to go out. Some of them in Timisoara developed even a network to uh, buy passports, to sell Roma actually, to buy your own freedom. They were giving 300 grams for a passport with a, a visa for Germany. So they could go easily. Uh, out of the country if they wish so. Sure, 300 grams of gold, that's a lot of money. But some of them uh, develop a mechanism that they, were, they, they can uh, borrow from somewhere and they were giving back with the work that they were doing in Germany or whatever Western European country. So Trump used that channels and he went to uh, uh, Germany, attend the conference and then get back in Romania. So security didn't even know. Actually, the ones from Sibiu didn't know. Because the ones in Timisoara were working together with the ones that uh, uh, were buying and selling uh, these passports, as I like to say, they were selling people. Because Romanian government, the communist government, was also selling Germans and Jewish to their states against money. So, in case of Roma, was nobody to buy them externally. By themselves, they managed to buy themselves from the security a passport to travel. That was the times. Getting back to uh, <clears throat> the danger of the uh, uh, Roma uh, uh, political empowerment. What I did also uh, analyze what are the biggest community and try to disperse them. I mean, the fact that there were thousands of people in the same place was a danger. So they start uh, uh, removing people and moving in other parts of the country with the reason that they had to reform the space and the geography, uh, working places to be in other parts, move in this way. So they wanted to control the population in this way, so they wouldn't organize. However, this also, I think, uh, to some level was a failure because in 83, Nicolae Gheorghe, together with uh, uh, Chaba, but others too, Bobu, the, a, a Roma lawyer, which was not registered as a Roma intellectual, from uh, Târgu Jiu, managed to organize a Roma festival during the communist period. So it was a festival there uh, with music, poetry, and so on and so on, speeches. Uh, and uh, I found two reports in the security uh, talking about this event. One is very appreciative towards Roma culture, saying that this culture needs to be encouraged. We need to support more activities in this because it's so beautiful, so romantic, so exotic. You know, this exotic image about Roma. And the other one was very uh, aggressive, saying, well, this is a danger because if these people organize, they have their own language and they have their own culture. And if they organize, that would be a danger towards our state. So, the communist leadership got bold signals. 
and they uh, intensify their uh, surveillance activities towards Roma intellectuals and traditional leaders in order not to organize in any sense. People were even arrested, blackmailed, corrupted some of them to get uh, uh, to become part of the security informers. In some cases worked, in some cases not. Well, my favorite perspective is the Roma perspective into that. I've been talking to uh, uh, hundreds of people that were passing through uh, uh, communism over the years and uh, um, some of them even were before that uh, uh, living in the uh, 30s and uh, uh, Second World War. So I try to, to, to talk to everybody and to understand in deep, you know, how they were passing through, what were the changes, the major changes in their life when the communists changed policies and uh, what happened to them emotionally, but not only emotionally, how they managed to struggle and to fight back if that was the case. Um, there are many stories that I can share with you, but uh, uh, my favorite one is uh, a discussion with a, a person that passed through uh, Second World War and uh, then communism uh, and sure, uh, what was after this. Um, so, he told me that, uh, you know, communism was the best period for him. And I asked him, you know, I heard that many times. Can you tell me why? And he said, uh, well, because before communism we were nothing. We were about being killed by Nazis, the Romanian Nazis. After that, we become human. We got access to uh, uh, basic needs, we had houses, we had uh, jobs. First time in my life I had a vacation, paid by state. I was paid to go on vacation. Nothing happened to Roma that before. You know, uh, when I got sick, they took care of me. My children were in kindergarten and then school and I didn't pay for that. I had uh, all my basic needs uh, uh, there. But, he said as well, there was a price to pay. I mean, his family was a nomad, uh, semi-nomad family. They were uh, uh, copper smiths, you know, uh, working uh, uh, in the winter uh, in the house and then uh, from spring to autumn, traveling and selling their products uh, around the country. So, uh, he said, we're giving up this. That was the price that we pay. Our lifestyle has changed completely. First of all, it was a shock. We couldn't um, uh, understand what happened to us and how actually we could live like that on a salary. We never had salary before. We were earning if we work and if we are capable to sell our products. If not, nothing. So, the communist managed to, uh, in his perception, to change uh, 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 his uh, 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 well, lifestyle, but not only that, his reference to the world. Why that? Because he saw the negative part of the communism, what he lost, but also he was appreciating what he got. And he considered that actually, because uh, uh, his grandson uh, is a lawyer now, uh, he said, look, how it was possible from traveling from place to place, selling our products to have a grandson that is lawyer today? Not possible. So the communists bring us, this is what he told me, this perspective that we can be as we want. We work, we earn, we educate, we get as high as possible. We don't? No. So um, that was, first of all, the struggle of the Roma. It was the price to pay for uh, social uh, protection, losing some part of uh, uh, cultural identity, cultural practices. And some of them accepted that, some other not. Some of them suffered, some other enjoyed. How this happened? Uh, uh, because also this distinction is important between sedentary and uh, um, um, ex-nomads. The sedentary that I talked to, they all considered that most, I wouldn't say all, but most considered that communism was really the best for them. And that's because they really feel like growing up as a community, but also as individuals. They become appreciated for their skills, for their profession. They lost some of the things. For instance, a lot of them didn't want to teach their children anymore to speak Romanes for two reasons. One, fear of, the, of being deported again, 
It happened in 40, uh, 42 was the census for Roma, and the language was the base of the census as identified heteroidentification as Roma. So uh, that was the first, and the second one was the fear that the children will have an accent in Romanian language, so they will be identified easy as Cigan. So communists managed to occupy their time in public sphere. When they were working for factories, they were supposed to wear that uniform, to do that practice, well, to uh, tolerate any humiliation. I will talk a little bit ab uh, about this. Um, but the time that they have in their family, and weekends, and uh, uh, evenings, the communists couldn't control. They were speaking the same language, they were eating the same food, they were dancing the same style, they were listening the same music, Nobody could control that time to become what the communists projected to become. So, probably the biggest problem of the communist regime to uh, assimilate Roma, as it was their program, was how the, uh, they control the time of the people, what they do with the time. And as well, uh, for sedentary Roma, uh, working in a factory sometimes was a privilege for blacksmiths, for instance. They were skilled with the metal, so they could work also in factory and learn easily a new profession. While for a musician uh, that was not qualified at all in this type of professions, well, they could work in this uh, uh, local orchestra and so on, but very few. The rest of them were supposed to go in factory and work as, as unqualified. For this one, this was humiliating because musicians are, you know, uh, well-dressed always, uh, they're looking to fashion, they're dressed up uh, in order to, you know, uh, do their profession. So, these people were supposed to work uh, uh, during the day in the factory, being the lower in the uh, uh, ranks uh, in, the, in that factory, and later on in the evenings or weekends they were uh, singing to the weddings, uh, uh, well-dressed and uh, uh, being what uh, the ancestors were being. So, that's something interesting too, because that was a struggle. The struggle was how communists occupy the time and what Roma did with their free time. So, my conclusion was that during the uh, official time of working, they become proletariat, good Romanian even, in the National Communist period. However, in the rest of the time, the free time, they were just Roma as they know the best how to be and live their identity and lives. So, to conclude, uh, Communists created the base for Roma movement today. Romania uh, has probably the biggest Roma community uh, in Europe and probably the biggest, most educated community in Europe. And that's because of the uh, uh, communist measures applied to Roma. That was the price to pay by the, uh, our ancestor uh, in order to lose some of their uh, you know, identity, culture, so uh, us to be more educated and capable to raise our voices and to stand for Roma rights and place in this, uh, this country and this world. Actually, um, if we look into the history to different political regimes, this oppressive regime create damage in the uh, 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 cultural dimension of Roma existence here in Romania. They wish that we become something else. Previous regime were killing Roma. So it was a physical uh, destruction. It's hard to measure what uh, uh, is worst. Probably both of them are worst. But what I want to tell you before uh, I think I need to close soon uh, is that when slavery ended in Romania, the policy name was Emancipation for Roma. Good. Then, when the eugenic period was and the Nazis were in power, um, it was extermination of the Roma. That was the policy. Well, ethnic cleaning, they call it, but still, you, uh, you can uh, name it in different ways. The result is the same. Then, communists had an agenda assimilation, that was the direction and the name of policy. Later on, after the revolution, in the 90s, the name for, of the policy was integration. And nowadays, 
The name is inclusion. So my challenge is to you, speaking about the political regimes and how they impact on Roma. What is the difference between all this and what they have in common, most of all? Probably here is the problem. The fact that others design policies for Roma without Roma being there to design policies for themselves. Nikolai Gheorghe, the Roma sociologist that grew up in the communism and developed a movement in the communism and formalized it after the communism, told me just four days before uh, he passed away the following. We were born too late for the national state, as activists, of course, and too early for what is due to come. So, if we reflect on that, if we think to what is due to come, what will be the place of Roma and what type of ideology will be so inclusive that Roma will feel comfortable as human beings? Thank you very much. This is Ciprian Nicola.